Macedonian War Machine. What was it based upon? How did it all work? And why was it so successful? You have to really go past the surface of how the Macedonian War Machine was able to do so many very difficult things. Why they were able to subdue Greece. That's the first thing. Because I think a lot of people overlook that. That is a very difficult thing to do because it's not like that this was just... You could just push them over. You can't do that with Greece. There were so many city-states. It's like you have a bunch of women that they're friends with each other one day and they're enemies the next. There's a lot of bickering and things like that, so... Those are the city-states of Greece. They had this war mentality. You know, they were always ready for war. So they had the phalanx. Now, Macedonia was actually just very weak comparatively before Philip. You're talking about taking something extremely small and taking on something way more massive way better at warfare. I mean, let's just put it like this. You have, if you were in a, picking in a video game, picking your your character or your team, you're picking one of the worst ones, or you're picking on, like, the highest difficulty, and that's what you're facing. So, how did this all work? Well, first of all, there was a slight bit of knowledge of Portion, engineering, and this all happens because Greece was an area where you can go and have more freedom. So you, you tend to get a lot of the people who are on the outside of Greece, Macedonia, Thrace, they come in there. People who are, there's an attraction to it because there's more freedom. Now, Macedonia did have a different structure, so did Thrace, and they were thought of to be as barbarians. You see, like, democracy was in Athens, and there, there was a division in Greece between the two types of ruling. Actually, this is a different type of ruling anyway, because the rule structure... Like in Sparta, you have a complicated rule structure because it's not just a king, but there's the power is diverted. It's not just that the king the king doesn't have ultimate power. They never liked to have to have one person have total power, but there was a certain way that they did things, a certain way that Athens did things, and that kind of spread out to city states that were under their influence. But of course, a city-state could change what they were doing from one thing to the next. Like I said, they were just like a bunch of women who they're friends one day and they're enemies the next. So, the, the structure of government, the biggest consistency is, is that there's not going to be one person with the power over the rest of the people. This was something that was hated. Now, as you get into Macedonia and Thrace, you more have like a tribal type of, instead of the city-state, it gets more tribal. Like you have a warlord ruling over it. You get small villages that are kind of have an, a loose alliance amongst them. And they didn't think of themselves to be any different than Greece. They were just not as sophisticated, supposedly. But the man ended up becoming more sophisticated through this. So you get you get somebody who, who knows a little bit about engineering. And he spreads those ideas. And, and what they did was they created mass artillery. Because at first they started building these to defend themselves. They started building more sophisticated catapults. And then the torsion catapult, they really increased the amount of force with which you can fling objects. I mean, these are just coming around. 
to have the ability to take something that's inanimate and use it in war. Where it takes operators to to use the thing. So, you know, through trial and error, and sometimes things blow up because of the wood breaks and people get injured. So, they make these big machines, these smaller machines, and they try and find the perfect combination. And when they have that, they build more and more of them. In Macedonia, you had a lot of horses, so they can, they can tie it into rope and make really strong rope to pull back release it, and fire an object. Now the torsion catapult has a more intricate, it's not just like you're just pulling back rope. If you have a bow and you just pull it backwards by itself, where you just have the string of, of the bow and you're just pulling that back, and you fire. But if the wood bends as well, so you have the wood that bends and the rope, you get even more firepower, and it hits even harder. So they had a lot of artillery. Okay, they built these things. And they they, they seem to en have enjoyed doing it and that they were making progress in it. And so they just were like, it was like a, a thing. Like, you know, when you ha have something, you start getting good at it. And people kind of take it on as a hobby. So they created this ar artillery and they had a lot of it because they kept building more and more of it. So they had different kinds. They had a variety of next thing is that they had horses, so they had a companion cavalry, a heavy cavalry. Now this thing advanced because Philip wanted to have better armor. He wanted he wanted to have better weapons, so he wanted he actually what he wanted to do was make them more like Greece. So he wanted to take them a step up. You know, he didn't want to have an army that was the levy army of citizens. He wanted to have a professional army to build them from the ground up, basically, like into a professional army. He wanted them to have nice armor, nice weapons. So this all comes into metal casting. Greece, they were not completely capable of mining in, on an unlike scale. They didn't like doing this, but they got their metal through other means, through trade and other things. And, and metal design, they weren't as good as other civilizations. But they were able to create certain things, uh, mass like their armor and weapons. Of course, you would have your own. See, but the thing is, is that the people would have their own. You didn't have somebody making weapons and armor for everybody. You went, you got your own, and then you went to war as a citizen soldier. Now, Macedonia, he made a professional army. So he had somebody else building their weapons and armor for them under his specifications. So what he started doing was organizing things. He organized their artillery. He organized their weapons and armor. He organized them into units. He trained them. They started off very poor, but he built them. He built a professional army. He built them into professional soldiers with, the, with a great deal of discipline. Okay, so that's the first part of that. Now there's Illyria and a lot of other hostile. You could say civilizations, but these are more like the same as Thrace and the same as Macedonia, where these are like villages under a warlord, but kind of under a common theme. There's more unity in those. In Illyria, they're more like raiders, so they don't really like civilization. And anyway, they're pushing into Macedonia. Thrace, they, it's kind of like if you didn't live in a certain area, then, as far as like having relations with them, could easily be negative relations. People had trouble getting along all along the north of Greece, within Greece itself. It didn't seem like there was a, anybody stepping into the role to say, "Hey, we want to live in peace." It seemed like they actually liked. They liked the way things were enough, or there was just too much of it. Was it was just too much the popular thing to do? War was like a something that was common. But the thing is that they weren't really professional armies. It's just people get together and they go and they do something. And I guess maybe it was fun for them to do that. Now this is different. Where you don't have like giant cannons blowing people's limbs off. You know, it's not like Vietnam or, and where there's all this artillery and stuff that just drives people completely crazy. War was more hands-on. You have like a spear or shield. You know, like they provided their own weapons and armor in those places. But in Macedonia, these were being produced. Like this became a system. 
It also became where you have roles. The people building the weapons have a role, and everybody, everybody is is kind of like you have a military organization. Okay, so that's basically what he built was a military organization. All the power was consolidated in Philip. He was more of a warlord than a king because they didn't have a kingdom. So what he did was he was basically taking something that was just hanging on to itself by a thread. And he's using these ideas and he, he probably got a lot of it from Greece, but he just expanded upon it. He started building longer spears. Pikes. I mean, this was probably just an idea that came out. Let's just have long pikes. So I don't think that he was too far off from what it ended up being. The Sarissa, the long spear, when he created these giant walls of spears, the tank of the ancient world, basically, when he created the heavy pike infantry, so he built those, they had smaller shields. You know, in China, they actually were using the heavy pike themselves. It wasn't the same exact thing. They built long pikes in the eastern part of the world as well. Their ideas were kind of pushed out there naturally. They had the crossbow. Basically, around this time, they had the crossbow already out there in China. So, you know, like, they just, they, they just thought of things like that. This was done by necessity with Macedonia, though, because they were in jeopardy. They were in danger of being swallowed up by the hostile bands of people that all get along with each other. Basically, and they have relations with them. So a good, good way of looking at it is, okay, Thrace, you have a bunch of villages. They're, but they all are Thracians. They might fight with each other, but it'd be more like a fist fight. You know, they might have a drink with each other. It's not really like you go to war against each other. That's the same thing in Macedonia. But now you have somebody, like a rallying point. And that is Philip. Because he is doing something. He's building something that nobody else in Macedonia, they can't compete with this. This war machine he built, and he, he didn't have a whole lot to build with in the beginning. So basically what he did is he tried through negotiation to get all of Macedonia to work together on this. And it worked to a certain extent, enough for him to build the beginnings of this, this army. And then the rest of them, when they saw what he was building, they either went along with it at that point, or when he went in there with his soldiers, it probably didn't take a whole lot. You know, maybe they were about to have a battle over it, which they weren't really doing that. It was more like they weren't like having an actual war against themselves before this. It was more like, you know, villages, maybe at a certain point. Point. There was times, but I mean, there was a there's they're still civilized enough where you don't have a village going to the next village and killing people and enslaving people in it. That would have pissed off a lot of other people. Basically, what happened was this army formed itself out of the ever swallowing up of Macedonia because as he negotiated the alliances with the villages, his army grew. Then the other ones go along with it more, but then the ones that actually resist, they see this force coming way better armored, and they know they just have no chance at all, so they have to go along with it. Did anybody resist to the point of bloodshed? Why would they? Look at what you're facing. Because what he did was he built something so staggering to look at by itself. They all had better armor, they had better weapons, they were far more disciplined, they had... They were just way more advanced as an army. And this is kind of strange. You have these villages with an army that's more advanced than anybody else. And it, yes, it's even more advanced than any other civilization. Why? Because he has made it into a priority. And no other civilization made it into such a priority as he did. He organized all of the different pieces of an army. All of the things that it needs to work. So then, you know, what he did was he organized everything else falling off of that. So then he started organizing the villages that all fell into under his rule. He organized all the structures that are necessary to continue a mass organization. So there was now an organization 
like there was wheels turning. What they became was like machinery. It's like if you had a situation that was like a catastrophe of some sort. That's how he looked at this. There's a lot of people that don't look at it that way when there's some, oh, well, you know, that are more passive about it. He was very much on top of things. He was so aggressive. To build them and to, to make them so more advanced. I mean, he was just very organized and very in control of things. He was just very organized and very in control of things. Kind of like if, you know, kind of like General Patton, you know, where, where he had to kick guys in the butt because they're on the beach just standing around. You know, like this, somebody starts shooting at them. And they're like, oh, what do we do? And the planes are flying over, and nobody really knows what he's over there, kicking him in the butt, yeah, getting people get going. Up, That's filler. Like Sometimes they just were like, well, you know, there's people that just stand around or just let things happen around them. Philip was not that way at all. He was the complete opposite. He was getting things going. He was pushing buttons and getting everybody moving in the right direction. He was taking all the gears and getting them moving. All as one working machine. This is probably the very first war machine. Because yeah, I, I did the thing on ancient Assyria, but it was not as complicated as this. They didn't have the type of organization. Now that he has Macedonia under control, if the Illyrians want to take on some of this, what happens in a battle? Well, the Illyrians were like swordsmen. They had some swords, shields, spears. Basically, when it came down to battle, and also you have slingers, they had very good of all of this. They were ready to fight, but they weren't ready for an actual battle, for warfare. They were now a joke. You just can't touch this thing. You can imagine them seeing this war machine coming toward them. Here's what would happen at the beginning of one of these battles. Here's the other thing. Philip was a mastermind at warfare. A military genius beyond. Here's how it works. They bring the heavy pikes out. These guys don't get involved yet. They're there. Now you also have the regular feelings. And these were well armored. Armor. Everything had a purpose. So you're still using the hoplite. Okay, and then you have your heavy cavalry. He got a whole lot of heavy cavalry. He armored the... He, he didn't want to weigh the horses down too much. They had plumes on them and what armor he could put on them. Now, usually when you look at an army, they all look different. All the people in the army look different. It's harder to mass produce for everybody as this thing grows. So later on, when Macedonia was under Alexander, you start using other methods because you have to bring in citizen soldiers but right now it's just a pure professional army and he probably lets some some levies in to increase his numbers but I, I don't think that he really wanted to I think he was such a perfectionist that he just wanted everything to look completely awesome so the artillery is in a safe place at the beginning of the battle where no enemy could possibly touch them okay they would have to get past the hoplites and the pike Felix. This cavalry, that's your mobility. This is the mobility of the force. Now, you don't need archers. If you have them, any archers that were around their region were also very adept at hand-to-hand -hand combat. There's a type of archer, actually, that has a shield. So it's, it's basically like you have your hoplite archer. And this was in use from there around the Black Sea and why? Because these were once Greeks that had colonized over there so they just kept the hoplite but gave them a bow and arrow because that's what the other civilization around them had. They had archers except these archers they could also they could get into hand-to-hand -hand combat. They couldn't have like a spear because what do you put it when you're using your bow and arrow but they had kind of a short sword and they had a shield so if they did get into hand-to-hand -hand combat, or where they needed to use their shield, they can actually do that. So if he had archers, I'm sure they were all on those lines. But he didn't need them. And this is why. You have the other army, and I'm sure they have archers and slingers. So you have your normal hoplites. Now, they create the wall of shields. They're the ones that are in front at this point. They're the ones that get close enough so that the enemy can actually unleash their missile weapons at this hoplite. The hoplites are protected in this fashion. They have on the leg greaves, so that protects the exposed part of their legs. 
the Romans used to only have a grief on one leg. But that's that could be explained later on. And that would be the leg that would be the closest to where that shield that closest exposed, exposed leg underneath there are much more massive shields. Which could be explained later on about their war machine, how it worked. They also had a war machine. This I'm sure influenced them greatly, of course. It influenced all near civilizations and it would go on to influence faraway civilizations. After Alexander, you also have this shield that could take up enough space to protect up to where the helmet So basically, with a family, there's very little exposure of flesh. You could actually have the shield down to your leg greaves and your eyes going over the shield and then you have on your helmet. So basically, you only have your eyes exposed. So you could watch at these arrows and everything fly into your shield. They have to just stand there and, and take that. There's also another thing that they can do if under heavy barrage is hide underneath their shields. So they start off like that and if it gets down to it they can get underneath their shield and the arrows could fly over and into their shield. So basically they're just deflecting the missile bombardment. And they're the only thing close enough for those guys. Now those guys would have to get out even closer if they wanted to try and attack the pike phalanx. And the artillery is even further away. The artillery is behind the pike phalanx and is firing now into whichever sector. And more than likely this is going to fire into their missile forces first. That's who they want to hit and get rid of. He wants to completely obliterate them first. In the meantime, his cavalry is moving the enemy army around. They're chasing them, and he's having them chase them all the way around while his cavalry goes through the battlefield and behind the missile forces, and these guys can't chase them. Now, any other cavalry which anybody who they're facing have would try and, of course, interfere with that. But the thing is, his cavalry was far superior. And they all, at the same time, working together would charge. So if you had a lighter cavalry, they would be smashed to pieces. They go in a circle and they shoot wool far and away, and other things like those. Those type of methods, which were coming around, which is basically to attack with a spear while you're on a horse, throw it while you're going in a circle around, grab your spear, throw it, while moving away from the enemy, because you're you're faster than them. He would just charge right into that. That companion cavalry would charge right into that. They would chase them. As, as a, they would go right into it completely. There would be no away from that. They would continue until they destroyed the enemy cavalry first. So even though the missiles are the first priority, when there is a cavalry threat, you deal with that immediately. So that takes precedence. But the whole main objective right now to destroy all the missile forces. The cavalry that comes along the way, they have to destroy that, of course. But they don't go chasing the cavalry right off the bat. Because it's, it's, it's harder to get to the enemy cavalry anyway. Because they, they, then they're moving you around. But they're trying to maneuver right now. And then when the enemy cavalry gets into their way, then they just smash right into them. So another thing is that these Macedonian horses were not only strong, but they were fast. So they were able to eventually, even if you had a lighter cavalry, and, and he kept the horses light enough. This is why he didn't completely armor them. You didn't have like a cataphract or... An ancient knight. These weren't that. These were actually perfectly done to be heavy cavalry that could still catch the enemy cavalry. They would just obliterate the enemy cavalry because they would be a much larger number because you had such a swarm of this heavy cavalry. So if you had a medium or a, a, a light cavalry, once they get hit, they're doomed. You would just smash right into them. Okay, so any cavalry near enough for him to get to, he's going to do that. Then, he's, then after that's done, well, his artillery is firing into the missile forces. Uh, if the infantry comes to engage, that's fine. They could take on, they could go move towards the phalanx, but then their own missile forces can no longer fire into that phalanx. So I'm sure that the missile forces are trying to get to maneuver themselves to fire on the uh, pike phalanx, who seems more exposed, or they're having some success in and finally, you know, taking numbers of the standard phalanx. Because, of course, even though that they're so well armored, you're eventually going to do some, da some damage there with your slingers and with your archers. Now, any chance that the cavalry gets to pounce on them, it's over with. Because a uh, missile force is not going to be able to 
withstand a heavy cavalry charge. The amount of damage a horse charging into you or somebody who's on a horse with a type of force, I mean, one hit of that person's sword is going to be so devastating. I mean, just the, the head of the horse ramming into somebody. I mean, every little thing. So when you have this giant mass of heavy cavalry crashing into you, which is exactly what they did. They would go around picking off the missile troops. The enemy infantry would get in close, and then if they get close to the first phalanx, the uh, first line of phalanx, they, they make room. Now, when the, there's no missile threat, you can bring in your pike phalanx, who is exposed against missile forces, and then they can engage the infantry, and that other phalanx can get out of there. If they can, if they're overwhelmed by other numbers, then both have to work together. So you have both of those. So while well, that's happening, their cavalry is being destroyed, and their missile force is destroyed. The artillery is very well coordinated, so when the companion cavalry actually gets the opportunity to destroy the missile forces, their own artillery would not be firing on their own cavalry. It would be firing on whatever is exposed without any threat to themselves. So but they're, they're, they're safe, they're behind the lines, so you would have to get through that. And for the missile forces to get to it, that would take a lot of time and maneuvering to get to there, because they would have to get past the phalanx, which would be covering that, the two different types of phalanxes. Basically, they want to get their pike phalanx in the, involved in the melee combat, so that their other phalanx, whatever's left from that, can cover whatever else they need to, and if they can, they will maneuver around with the collapsing flank. What that is, is whoever is, has been successful, whichever family, they can now move over behind the enemy infantry. Which would end up occurring with no missile forces left. Because if there is any, they're going to get destroyed by the companion cavalry. And once the companion cavalry has destroyed all of the, the enemy cavalry, they are going to pound in behind that enemy infantry. And so now you have everything just coming in, swallowing up whatever enemies left. And that's probably when they would try to flee, but they would be cut off from all directions. After one battle facing this type of organized military machine, you would not want to face them again. But of course, uh, people were hard-headed, and they would think of that there would be a certain way that they could deal with this. But the problem is, is that this is almost foolproof. You really would need to have almost the same type of structure to deal with it. And the, the other problem is, is that they don't really have the forces to deal with it anyway. They're like, well, we'll see if we try this, there's nothing. There's always, it's completely, there's a contingency amongst this military structure. Because with the artillery out of the way, you can't get to that. If you had your own artillery, that would be fine, but they don't usually even have any artillery. They might have the most basic form of catapult, but that would be a rare situation as well. They, they, they would rely on their archers and their, and yeah, and to wear down their phalanx, but they're fighting, they're firing into the hardest to hit type of type of military unit at this time. I mean, it's just it's just really hard to cause a lot of casualties firing right into a phalanx because you're mostly going to hit their shield, you might hit their leg greaves, you might hit their helmet, and they might survive, but they can also go underneath those shields as well. These, these, this actually happened a lot, where they would successfully completely deflect an enemy barrage of arrows. It's happening against the Persians. And the Greeks, the phalanx, they would fire completely, uh, they, they would have a lot of their barrages completely ineffective against the phalanx. Because it, can, it, was, it was the best counter if you were going to have to take enemy fire. So, so then they're vulnerable because they have to scatter around and when they get scattered, they're even, they're even, they're just left out there. What what she also could do is because the companion cavalry could even split up into. Of course, he tries to keep them all together. But when you have like three different missile units, they'll break up and go and hit all three with a smaller smaller numbers, of course. But there there were such a huge number of that, and then they would split up and and destroy those three, take them out of the game. Of course, they like to stay together, though, but... but and then, when they go charging into the back of the enemy, they might split up to hit different enemy units, or to surround them, even 
even more so that it's harder for them to escape. All of this has been practiced. It's like if you were on a football or baseball team, all the practice that goes into it. He was so organized, he had contingencies for all of this. But basically, just the basic principle of this type of warfare is the most invincible type of warfare. If you were to even try to use this type of tactic in a video game, that's a military game. And say you're wondering exactly, with your smaller numbers, how you're going to uh, fortify position. One of the main things is you always have to be facing any, any possible enemy. So, uh, being outflanked is, is going to have to be covered. So if you had, all your infantry would have to be in like a square. And that's like what they're going to attack. You would leave like something that has no, f no exposed flanks. So if you had three or four different infantry units, they would be facing, in, they would be either in a, a square or triangu triangular position, as much as possible, so there's no fl uh, flanks. Now, if somebody's firing over that to try to hit the guys who would be facing the other way. They can stay facing that way until that their attention has to be diverted to whoever's on the other side. That's the thing that they, that's like, it's like, come attack us, you know? Like, that's the thing for them to go and attack. And that's left as best as possible to deal with themselves. If, if it came down to it, you would have your uh, siege weapon operators get inside the, get within like the circle of those units. So they might fire, and then at the perfect time, they'll they'll actually go inside of the square or triangle. They'll stay they'll stay within there. Now, hopefully, they have some shield or something in case they start getting under enemy fire. So there's that. And why do you want to do this? Because you want to buy time. Because your companion cavalry, that's who's going to be flying around the field, going all over the place, picking off the enemy in order of priority. So they want to destroy the missile forces as quickly as possible, and then any cavalry, any enemy cavalry is after that. Unless that those cavalry get in their way, then they want to destroy them as soon. So it's, uh, very, it's got to be very well coordinated. They don't touch the enemy infantry at all. The companion cavalry. They stay away from it. Unless uh, there's there's no other threat. I mean, there's nothing more important. Or if they get caught into a situation where they have to, they will charge into the behind of some. Or there might be a weaker infantry. They'll just smash right through them. But they gotta get. They really want to get that missile infantry more than anything. So that's what they do. So they go for the enemy missile infantry. So you had fifty thousand enemy. And you had like 10,000 infantry. Okay. They're going to try and swallow up that. So they're going to end up facing phalanxes, which are which are all facing outward, but are combined into either a square or a triangular position. The pipe phalanxes would be more closer to the rear, I imagine, to be as f farther away from enemy missiles. And to defend themselves as much as possible like against that, they would, they would face whichever direction and try their best. But be as far away from enemy missile attention as possible. So anyway, whatever the case is, you're going to, I'm sure, they're going to take a lot of casualties until the, all the enemy missile forces are completely destroyed, but a lot less considering. Now the enemy will get surround that, go ahead. Get your infantry in there, surround them, fire into that. Meanwhile, the companion cavalry is going around and destroying what they can. Anything that they can get their hands on, that's a missile troop. They're going to just crush them. They might spread out with that to move one away to divert some units and then move in and pulling them in different directions just to get to those missile troops until they're completely destroyed. And then they're going to completely destroy the enemy cavalry. So now you have the enemy infantry and they're fighting, they're attacking that. So say that you have all this giant mass around there, and they're, they're winning, but they're fighting against something that's the most fortified type of enemy. Once the companion cavalry has finished off those other forces, they can charge behind whatever enemy. So imagine if you had this giant swarm of enemies surrounding the square or triangle of smaller unit. Wow. Right in the back of the companion cavalry. They can pull off, go ahead and do it again. So you're attacking them. But you're getting attacked from behind by this companion cavalry. So even if you have like 50,000 against 10,000, 
Now, some of those units are going to break off, of course. They're going to chase the companion cavalry. Well, the companion cavalry is going to go around the enemy formation, and they are faster. Now, there's they have complete cavalry superiority. If you had any missile, other missile troops like archers, they would have hid the entire battle. They would have stayed out of the way. But now they would come in from behind, and they would shoot into the, the back of the enemy. So the companion cavalry would circle around, hitting the enemy in the back. So even if you have, like, this giant, massive enemy, now they're getting attacked from behind by this. Now they're getting pulled away from what they were attacking. So it's the most effective type of combat. You can win if you had 10,000 against 60,000 with this type of strategy. It's the most invincible strategy ever created. The Macedonian battle tactic was not proper, properly executed throughout history as, as as Philip is the one that did it the best then Alexander all you had to do was carry on with that so the thing is that when they faced Greeks with with their phalanx they would just hammer them with their artillery oh, yeah. that right there would do a lot of damage to the enemy phalanx so when they get in close and then they have to face the pike phalanx and they didn't they weren't really big on archers and stuff like that those were more of the tribal, the village, villager type of civilization. These, these hoplites versus their hoplites with the pike phalanx and with, they, they have to engage or they just get sit there and get destroyed by the artillery. As soon as they engage anyway, they're dead because uh, that's when the, the companion cavalry would smash them from behind. So that's how he ended up taking over all of Greece. You have no chance whatsoever. It's because of this cavalry superiority too. Any type of Greek cavalry is just going to get trashed by this, Macedo this Macedonian companion cavalry. So it's whatever you do, you're screwed. So even if all of Greece worked together, put their hoplites together, their chances maybe it would take a long time for them to destroy that center is well armored hoplite. It's like you have that you have that just hanging there waiting for the enemy to just attack this. Attack that. And then you know the the cavalry companion cavalry picks off whatever threat in order. And then when they're they have complete superiority, they just charge it right in behind. And there's no way that a, a hoplite army can can have any chance at all. And they can't just stand there or they'll get they'll get smashed down by the artillery. So this shows how effective it was. All Alexander had to do was just go on with the model that was already created for him, so you think, what a military genius, Alexander, look at all the, the territory he took over. Philip could have done the same exact thing. He was the better general because he created this military machine. He executed it even better than Alexander. All Alexander had to do was continue with it. There's an example, they say that in a battle against the Persians, that what ended up occurring was that Alexander... It's companion cavalry. They saw the archers in front of the enemy infantry. They said, well, this is the weak spot. No. No. Archers are the priority. At the beginning of the battle, if they're just standing, if they're anywhere where they can get to them, they're going to. It was across the river. Whoa. That's where they're going. In this case, those archers ran to try to get behind the infantry. They just smashed into both, both of it, the infantry and the archers. Which they can do that. They can even uh, engage heavy infantry and, and have more success than other cavalry. They could actually get off their horses and fight, you know, hand-to-hand -hand combat. These guys were well-trained. You had, like, heavy infantry on top of horses that were very strong horses and very mobile. These were, these were very good cavalry. They might have been the best cavalry of the time period. I think that the people underestimate how good this cavalry actually was. So that's why they were able to get around the field of battle. Oh, there's Darius and his chariot, and they actually get to it. That's what they could do. They could go anywhere. Because they just speed around, they get around the battlefield, and they find anything that's exposed. Now, of course, your priority is the enemy, enemy missile troops. Because they could do severe damage to a pike phalanx. They could cut it down. He keeps his pike phalanxes out of that missile fire until he has a chance to to assault them as much as possible. So the other phalanxes would go first. 
Those would be exposed first, because he wants them to absorb the missile fire. He's not stupid. You can cut down a pike phalanx very quickly with missile fire. So those, but in an in a infantry hand-to-hand -hand battle, those things are unbelievable. Of course, the Romans, they found a way around that. But they were lucky they didn't have to take on Philip, because Philip would have destroyed the Romans. Alexander would have destroyed the Romans. That's because they properly executed this. Because even if the Romans came under them with their giant shields, cut the pikes down, cut the pikes down, and got in there, they would be smashed from behind by the superior cavalry, which was not executed properly by the Seleucids, by by Pontus, and by other civilizations, Pergamon, other civilizations. Pergamon, of course, was actually an ally of Rome. So, they were more friends with Rome than the other civilizations that used any Macedonian-style warfare, Macedonian uh, tactics, and Tigonus tactics that he used. He didn't, com he didn't, because what would happen was, is that they didn't, they didn't, it's just like things get lost over time. They didn't completely use the cavalry. The way that, I mean, there they, became like a, well, we can just do it with the infantry. And they bring in some other types of troops. The most important thing for this is you have to have a massive heavy cavalry. You can't just have some of the pieces of it. You want that artillery, you want the infantry, the two different types of phalanxes, and that heavy cavalry, that companion cavalry. And you have to have them do everything in that order. Now, they wanted, they didn't want to be the same military mind as it, Philip or as Alexander, they wanted to set themselves apart, so they would do things a little differently. Anything differently they did that deviated from that plan, it was, uh, it was going downward. You weren't, you were making yourself inferior. And they all did that. They all chose to do things a little bit differently. They would change down because they wanted to make their own, to do their own thing, to show their own military prowess. But that but didn't, that didn't improve it. It did the opposite. Alexander, he continued with his father's structure, but he... He was such a... So maniacal about using this thing. I mean... So he, he, he properly employed the battle tactics, and the generals under him knew it. So they didn't try to put their own stamp on it. And Alexander, he, he just was like his father with it. Uh, I don't think he had the understanding of, of warfare that... That his father had. He didn't need to. He had the understanding of what this military machine was. He already knew the, how to, to do it. He knew what was supposed to be done with it and how it operated because that's what he was taught. So he, he learned all this from his dad, his father. So that passed it to him. So the reason they were able to take up, to take over so much of Persia and to even into India to take on these armies with elephants. You know, they, they had this. His cavalry was doing tremendous damage to troops in India. Because they were going around and cutting off those missile forces. They couldn't really get to the elephants. Your horses are scared of the elephants, but they would still maneuver their horses around and cut off and take down in priority enemy forces. And then just have to hope that your infantry can hold against those elephants. You know, if it was Philip, he would have had the artillery firing on those elephants. It's hard to get it into there. It's hard to get into that terrain. He would have found ways to have his artillery set up in proper places where it could fire into the elephants. And that would have just... That would have... They would have had, I think, a lot easier time with his organization. He was much more organized than Alexander. Alexander didn't have the civil organization that Philip did. He just kind of conquered places. And that's why after he died, things collapsed. Philip was much more organized, much more on top of things. He thought about things before doing them. He had everything all mapped out. He looked at the big picture of things. So that's why to me, he was the greatest general in history. The closest to him in thought process are two different individuals. Of course, well, besides his son, because his son was taught these things, but he didn't completely have the mindset, but Patton and Napoleon were both similar in, in, in mentality to Philip. 
where you're looking at the big picture of things. And you're, you, you know, uh, basically what Philip did was create an uh, army uh, a tactic that wins by itself. You just have to, I mean, it's like you have a template of war. And you don't even have to change it. it, it adjust, it's so easy to adjust it to any situation by what, what the way you have everybody deployed. It's so easy to use it. The, the most difficult army to face with this is horse archers. Because they'll run around and your cavalry, but you'll eventually get to them with your cavalry. There's problems with that type of cavalry because horses don't always do what you tell them to do when faced with, faced with peril. So after a certain point, you can catch them. You can catch them when you have a cavalry. So yeah, they're firing into it. They're taking a lot of losses. That's why Alexander started employing his own horse archers because they were the biggest thorn in his side. They were the hardest thing to deal with was horse archers. So what you would do is you would just need more cavalry, more heavy cavalry, light cavalry to take them on. I guess you know. Just for the sake of horse archers. If you had an army of horse archers, Scythians might have been uh, one of those types of foes where you would have to chase them all over. And, you know, anything in civilizations that were around the Caspian, you know, so south of the Caspian, and where they were just, they had basically grew up in the saddle. Kind of like Attila the Hun in the Huns. This this was spread all around the region. This, this growing up on horseback, basically, where you're already you know how to ride a horse and shoot from a horse. It's a little bit different than when you're being chased by a companion cavalry, but still, they were the most effective weapon against that battle tactic. But you can still win with it. You can still win against that. But that's your worst. That's, that's your toughest foe right there. That. So that's basically how they were able to take over all of Greece. Greece is a pushover because of this military tactic. When they tried to rebel, Thebes got destroyed. You know, to say, okay, stop. Stupid. We can easily destroy all of you. And uh, Athens, they got severely punished. A lot of people were killed and slaughtered by Alexander himself when they rebelled. Showed no mercy to the captives. And, they, and they, they, there was a time when they had to take on Tyre, which was this island out there. That was a different situation as well. The engineering had improved by then to where they had siege towers that were fortified on ships. They were able to get them up close. And once they get into the city, and, and, and another thing with this tactic that's different is what I was talking about was a defensive strategy. Offensively, if you would try and get them into situations where uh, their flanks are covered, you want to use your cavalry first to cut, take down the necessary troops. If you were invading a city, you would want to send your cavalry in first, maneuvering enemy forces around and hitting whatever you can. And when you do move your infantry in, they want you want them to be like supported by buildings on both sides and they have to always be making they always have to cover like you would have two forces one behind one covering the front so that you just don't have your flanks exposed so they have to they have to move carefully through there use your cavalry to sweep around hit people move them and then you can move them in so you'd be moving through buildings like just making sure everything is covered and no flanks are exposed and taking your time so you can imagine like having a pipe thing stuck between buildings with their pikes out and then so that the enemy comes out the alleyways and side into the pikes and then they try to fire and then the companion cavalry comes in behind and smashes them down so and then they have the artillery capable of destroying the wall to destroy enemy wall crushing the walls and smashing them because if you can also practice you can find where the integrity of the wall can be taken away so that's you know any, any type of towers, you would want to take those out. You just want to get your army into the city carefully. Into places and you, and you take your time with things like that. But they were able to do that, or if an enemy fought, met them on the field of battle, facing these type of tactics. And if the enemy did try to be defensive and sit there, you would attack them with their artillery. So when they're being rained down on artillery, they try to engage, and then that brings about what I discussed earlier.